decisions kind of all led to a very big change in Warhammer because by then I, I, I realized that the th third edition didn't really work. So I wrote the fourth edition uh, and I actually did all the basic work over Christmas. It was going to be Christmas of the preceding year. We saw, it came out in September, if I remember right. Late September, maybe October, first week in October. Uh, and it'd be 1992. And I wrote the core game over Christmas 1991. And that's the sort of timescale we could work with in those days. We must have... We might even have been start, start No, no, we must have started work after Christmas, even on the plastics. Plastics would have had to have been ready for Easter. So that's the sort of speed we were working at, uh, which is unthinkable later on, you know, we, we, it really was very quick. And the production values were, um, they went deliberately more uh, simpler, but they were inevitably simpler. And the reason for that is because we'd moved part of the buyout at involving moving the studio and that had involved actually changing the way the studio worked. We used to be an old-fashioned hands-on production studio with lots of um, finished artists and production staff. Um, photo typesetting machine uh, and, and that sort of thing. When we moved to the new studio we went to a desktop publishing operation. I think we'd already been put, experimenting with that. So Macintosh based the pay, uh, we still did paste up, but it was a lot less work intensive. We had far fewer paste up artists. So a lot of, we went from having, I, I don't know how many staff, let's say about 60. We went from having 60 staff to having about uh, 30 or 40. We, we lost all of our old style production staff. And at the same time, we actually lost some of our um, uh, games designers because we decided we weren't going to be doing uh, uh, so much in the way of um, uh, board games design or role-playing design although we retained some but it was definitely a smaller scale operation and that's why the fourth edition is back to although it's a big box it's back to that same three three books in a box, uh, box format the reason that is it, the reason why we went to that is because they're easy to produce. So you can do one, get it off to the repro house, and all repro graphics are still done out of house at this stage. It's not a full desktop publishing operation, it's desktop half, desktop half production. So we could write and do the production, uh, do the basic layout on a computer, but we were still producing effectively, producing galleys. We were just running them out on a, um, uh, on a printer, uh, a normal, um, it wouldn't be a dot matrix printer, it would be a laser printer, a, a good quality laser printer on good quality paper, rather than um, uh, on, on film on, with a, uh, with a uh, uh, photo mechanic, with a, uh, I say photo mechanic tracker, uh, with, with, a, with an old fashioned sort of um, typesetter. Um, and we, we went with that operation. Um, and it, it just made things simpler. We, we could go to the repro with the first book whilst we get on with the second, go to repro with the second book while you get on with the third and so on. So by the time we got all three lined up uh, and all the a, uh, SRA1 boards, a big board, that big, you had to design that early on because the, um, all the cutouts had to, be, uh, had to be made. You had to make a cutter machine to do that. So all these processes had to be aligned, <laughs> which is quite interesting. That's project management. Um, but by then we got a hedge around that. Um, so we managed to deliver everything into Eastwood factory. I think it might've been the first week in September. And then they worked like mad to assemble everything, get it ready for, uh, on sale in October. Um, and that would include the plastics. So it was quite an exciting thing to do, but, um, you can see the game design actually took a real backseat to everything else. Because organising the plastics, organising the cutter guys, the SRA ones, the print, the repro, that, that, that's where all the energy goes. And the games design, as I say, I did, the, I did all of that, and I also did the games design. So, um, I mean, I had the other, I had playtesting and the other guys to help me. It was the first time we really took playtesting seriously, I think. Um, so, Jervis would have been there, Andy Chambers would have been there, Nigel Stillman would have been there. Uh, 
And we all kind of pitched in on these things. Um, yeah, and by the time we'd got the first, the by the time we'd got the game out, we also had to be working on the first supplement, which was the Empire, which we'd been doing bits, we'd been doing bit by bit and publishing it in White Wolf. Um, so we already had quite a bit of it worked through. So that wasn't such a big job. Um, uh, I, I think I did most of it. Um, it doesn't actually have a credit in it. So it's one of the very early ones where I decided that we wouldn't credit the writers because I thought we ought to get away from that cult of personality which we'd had, especially with writers. But unfortunately, John Blanche then pitched in and they said, no, and all the artists have to get credited. So we ended up crediting everyone his dog apart from the writers. So we gave up and we just credited everybody. But um, uh, if it doesn't have a credit in, chances are I wrote it because I would have been trying to make a point. <laughs> um, I did the first uh, 40K one as well, I think Space Wolves. That doesn't have a credit. Um, but we'd already done a lot of it through White Dwarf, so we were able to use the White Dwarf colour pages as part of the project because we couldn't afford to do anything else. The reason why everything had to be done on a bit of a budget wasn't just because we didn't have the staff, it was because we now... Um, as a management team, specifically Tom Kirby, but as a management team, we now owed the venture capitalists, let's say 14 million pounds. I, I don't know that it was 14, that's just the number I think it was. When you owe 14 million pounds, it does tend to sober you somewhat when it comes to spending money. Um, every year we had to service that debt. That debt was effectively equivalent to the old profit, let's say it was a million pounds. So we had to generate a million pounds of profit before we made any money. So we had to build the business. We didn't have any money spare. We had to run everything on the shoestring insofar as we could. And what money we had, a lot of it went into the studio, but it went into capital. It went into a new Sun server for the, um, which is a, a, a big central server for the uh, intranet which was a new marvellous thing at the time. The new um, computers, and these things were primitive. You know, these are the early Macs. Um, uh, the hard drives were, you know, not, you couldn't get a lot on a hard drive. And so we, and these things were relatively expensive at the time. Um, and so on. Um, I think we already had the camera equipment, the large format cameras. We were still taking photographs using um, uh, plate cameras and film. Uh, certainly in the early days, we s replaced those with digital backs, which just went into the big large format camera. Uh, so, yeah, we spent a lot of money on basic on kit because we had to. Uh, and then on the other side of the business, where they were building um, the shops, we had to spend money on shop fits and employing shop staff. So we built the business quite rapidly and my mission was to provide the product and at some pace. So everything had to be done fast and dirty by 5.30. And Tom tasked us with doing two big core games a year, at least one board game and one other game. So we produced a lot of things using materials we already had. Uh, Tyranny's Attack, for example, was done like that. Uh, Jervis did a whole series of board, small board games. We relaunched Talisman. That was a bit of a pain, but we did. Um, and so on. You know, we were really, ch we were chucking it out. Um, and if some of the gate, some of the actual war game by the 40k or Warhammer wasn't brilliantly finished or play tested. It wasn't through lack of effort, but it was simply because we were going at such a pace. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I remember the fourth edition. Fifth edition, by then, we, uh, Thomas, I think, did Thomas come on board by then? I don't think he had. But by fifth edition, it was a tidy up because I thought the format was good. Uh, and then we relaunched the army books in a slightly cheaper format, which I didn't like, to be honest. That was because the sales guys felt they were too expensive. They were 116, 124 pages, uh, which meant that they had to sell for, I think at the time it was over 10 pounds. And they wanted something that could be sold for five pounds. Uh, I think we don't think we ever quite managed that, but 
So we had to cut a lot of the background and stuff out, which I, I really didn't like. I felt that the whole concept originally was that you should have the background and the stories and the inspiration as part and parcel of that book. It wasn't just a army list. Uh, I think that's mis misreading it. But that's what we had to do. So we did our best, but um, at the same time, uh, I think it was a mistake. But there you go. That was the fifth edition. Um, and by then I'd stepped away from it slightly. I think I did write it. I did, yeah, I did the whole thing. But because it was only a rewrite of the fourth, I was able to just basically tart up the fourth edition. I don't think it was a huge job. Um, the bigger job was actually uh, uh, the, the magic system, which we couldn't fit into the fourth edition. And we, we'd always wanted to, I think we'd had this idea of doing a card based magic system for a long time. So cards were fashionable, you know, they were, the idea was in the air. I couldn't fit it into the box for the fourth. So we did a separate yeah, uh, box with all the cards in. And in retrospect, that was a huge mistake. Um, not as because it didn't work as a game, it worked really nicely as a game, but it came out at the same time that we were building the business. And part of building the business meant internationally. So all of a sudden, it seemed that way to me, within a year or two, we formed strong alliances with French, Spanish, Italian and German businesses. And we ended up buying out uh, the French and the Spanish businesses. We founded a new business for Germany and we founded a new business for Italy. So we very quickly went from being a company that made English language product to being a company that had to make multi-language product. And that meant everything had to be in Italian, everything had to be in Spanish, everything had to be in German and French, as well as in uh, uh, English. Well, at the time, publishing cards was fiendishly expensive and you had to do big print runs. But we couldn't do print, big print runs in Italy or Spain or Germany or in France because these were startup companies. They didn't have the sales volumes to sustain them. So every time we had to print, or re and especially reprint, Warhammer Magic in Italian, we were losing money because we couldn't sell it for what it costs us to make it. Uh, and produce it and, and, and everything. So it was a massive uh, drain. And the other thing was all of our box sets, all of a sudden we had to have a Spanish box set, so on and so forth. You couldn't stock it. So what we had to do was go to a multilingual box set. The salesman hated these and I got an endless stick, but we couldn't do anything else. Um, the text on the box sets had to be in every language. And we ended up adding Chinese and Japanese to that as well. So you can imagine. Um, so all those changes had to be managed alongside changes to the actual games. Uh, so in many ways, the, game, the games took a bit of a, I wouldn't say back seat, but for fifth edition, we had a good Warhammer. It worked really well. It didn't need changing particularly. It needed updating, mostly in the light of playtesting actual gaming experience. So I would say that version was pretty close to being perfect as an iteration of the early Warhammer. Um, and it's fourth and fifth, and in fact, fourth is still my favorite version to this day. And the reason I say that is because although fifth took account of some playtesting, I thought some of the changes were a bit mincing. They were a bit kind of <laughs> detailed changes that really didn't need changing. If you're making a new edition, yeah, you might as well take advantage of those things and make those changes. Um, and that's kind of all I remember. The next version of Warhammer, the sixth, was the one I handed over. Um, so I didn't do the work on that, except I briefed it. And as part of that brief, I included the core games design. And the core games design um, uh, was uh, it was really just uh, it, uh, to, to, to keep it essentially as as, as before. There was no um, there was no uh, uh, it, it wasn't up to the designer to rewrite Warhammer. It was a new version of the game. The only diff the only change was the magic system. 
And I remember talking that over with, uh, with Thomas, Thomas Pyrenin, who, uh, who did the design work on six. And he uh, came up with the idea of doing the new, I think it was dice-based system, uh, which sounded great to me. And I thought, yeah, that, that will work just fine. Um, uh, it's like a dice pool, if I remember right. Um, and that was the big change for six. And other than that, I don't really remember anything about it. I must have played it on occasions, but I, I was kind of busy in a management role by now. Um, so I wasn't part of the design team. I was still there, and if the designers wanted to come and talk to me about stuff, they did, and some did and some didn't. You know, I could mentor them. And I continued to do that for the rest of my time at Games Workshop. Um, and depending on who, who it was, some people took advantage of it and some didn't. I mean, Alessio Cavatori in particular, I worked with fairly closely on things. He'd, if he had an idea or if he wanted to work something through, he'd often come and talk to me about it. Um, Andy Chambers, not, not so much. I think he tended to talk to Jervis, and Jervis was his mentor, really. Um, and again, Jervis, I think Jervis was pretty confident on doing stuff on his own. But sometimes the guys doing this, the um, supplements would come and talk to me about things. Um, and uh, that, that, that was kind of it, really. So, so beyond that, I don't know much about Warhammer kind of took on a life of its own. Um, up until uh, I left. I left in 2010, and I think Age of Sigmar came out very soon after. So Age of Sigmar must have been in the works when I was there, but it was obviously being done in a secretive fashion because I didn't find out about it. <laughs> um, and Age of Sigmar basically drew a line under Warhammer, and uh, I, I don't think it's been the same game since. Um, whilst I was there, I did get the opportunity to do a, an offshoot of Warhammer called Warhammer Ancient Battles, which is a historical version of Warhammer, and that used the version of 4th that had been updated. So it came out between 4th and 5th. In, in effect, it was a preview of 5th edition. Um, and that was, was pretty successful. Me and Jervis had the idea of doing that, uh, together with the twins, because we'd been using Warhammer to play historical war games. Um, and we wanted just to print it and publish it ourselves, but the, um, we, we, and I, so I took that to the rest of the um, board, well, the board, the management uh, uh, executive, but we, it was decided we couldn't actually do it because it was the word Warhammer and the game was uh, copyright games, games Workshop Citadel. So, Whereas we'd quite, we thought we could perhaps take a license out to do it, but I think the decision was we'd never license those things out. And to be honest, they have been true to that, even to this day. They license out things, the IP, but they've never sub-licensed out a core game in that way. Um, so we had to publish it within the company, which made it really quite awkward, it, it, largely because we were then saddled with some big company costs, especially when it came to accounting, for what was effectively a little company. Um, and I remember there was one year, Gaze Workshop were going through some really, really, a, a really bad patch. I think costs had gone through the roof. The salesman had overordered as they usually do, and so we'd ended up with massive overstocks. And the year, the total profit for the year, and these, by now the company's turning tens of millions of pounds, and the total profit of the year was like 30,000 pounds. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, that's not very much. Oh, coincidentally, it's the entire profit for Warhammer Historical War Games. <laughs> it was 30,000 pounds. Before, you took the accounting into account. And once they put the accounting into account, Warhammer Historical War Games made nothing. <laughs> because the cost of putting it through the accounts was the same as the cost of putting a 40 million com pound turnover company through the accounts. Uh, it was just ridiculous. Uh, but that's, that's the way it happened. Uh, and when I, I think before I left, the uh, Warhammer Historical War game had been closed down. It was always very much the um, fly in the ointment, uh, the uh, slightly uh, unwelcome uh, uh, guest at the party, as it were. Uh, it was really me and Jervis doing something off our own backs. Um, great shame, but I was quite pleased with it, what we did for it. And I thought at the time it was very well done and we actually got some very good work done by out of house people doing supplements for that. So shout out for Warhammer Historical as part of the family. 
And that's, that, that, I think, is it for Warhammer. That's all I can... That's my experience of writing, writing Warhammer and doing stuff uh, for fantasy.